In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Pat Williams. He's basketball Hall of Famer, co-founder and senior vice president of the NBA's Orlando Magic. He's played an integral part of NBA history, trading for Julius Irving, Moses Malone, and he's even drafted Charles Barkley and Shaquille O'Neal. He's a top speaker. He speaks to Nike and many more. He talks about the books he's written, upcoming Coach Wooden, he fought cancer, and he even has 19 kids. That and much more coming up next. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. I'm honored to have Pat Williams today. Pat Williams is a basketball Hall of Famer. He's co-founder and senior vice president of the NBA's Orlando Magic. And you know, anyone who knows anything about the NBA you know, he's played an integral part of NBA history, not only bringing the NBA to Orlando, but he's traded people like Pete Maravich. He's traded for Julius Irving, Moses Malone, and Penny Hardaway. He's drafted Charles Barkley, Shaquille O'Neal, Maurice Cheeks, and many more. He's also, I mean, if that's not enough, he's one of America's top motivational speakers. He's addressed companies such as Coca-Cola, Disney, IBM, Nike, just to name a few. And he's authored over 85 books. And his most recent upcoming title is Coach Wooden's Greatest Secret. And I read Wooden, the book Wooden, every single year. So I'm especially excited to read this one. Pat, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Jeremy. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And I look forward to our visit. There's so many, you know, that, that's probably one of my longest intros. And there's so many more things that I could have mentioned, which we'll get into. But first of all, most people don't read 85 books in their lifetime. You've written 85 books. What's that writing process look like for you? Well, it's a good question, Jeremy, but the ideas have to well up from within. And uh, I've been very fortunate over the years to have lots of welling up. And uh, these ideas come to me in various forms. Most of my writing uh, is triggered by leadership, uh, teamwork, uh, winning slash success. Uh, I think those are the areas that I write in primarily. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a saver. A anytime I come across a, a great story or an anecdote or something that I think might fit into a book someday, I save it and keep it on file. Yeah. So my research is done in the flow of life. So when it's time to write the book after a publisher signs off on it, I've, I've done most of my research. So it's an ongoing process, and uh, as long as the ideas keep flowing, Jeremy, I, I'm able to keep writing. I love it. And so how do you choose Wooden for your latest book? Well, I've been very fortunate. I was very fortunate. Uh, Coach Wooden let me into his life in the last decade of his life, and I've since then written three books about him. Uh, the first one was called How to Be Like Coach Wooden, and then a few years ago I wrote a book called uh, Coach Wooden, The Seven Principles That mm -hmm. Shaped His Life and Will Change Yours. And this most recent book is called uh, Coach Wooden's Greatest Secret. And it came from having dinner with him one night uh, at the Valley Inn near his home in Encino, California. That was Coach Wooden's favorite restaurant. And as we were sitting there, I just asked him a question. I said, Coach, in your 90, 90 years on earth, have you come up or discovered uh, one secret of success. I mean, that was the question I asked. And in his wonderful, understated way, he said, well, he said, the closest I can come uh, to one secret of success is a lot of little things done well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what he said to me. And, uh, and so I thought, boy, that would be a good book one day, you know, if we could expand on that topic. And so we have, and uh, the end result is this book that is just coming out now, uh, Coach Wooden's Greatest Secret. I'm looking forward to it. So that brings up a question, which, you know, so what would you say now to that question, that same question? Um, what would be the one if, secret? Yeah. If somebody asked me what's yeah. the secret? Well, I would have to say that, 
when your greatest talent crosses over or intersects with your greatest passion, uh, you have found the secret to success in life. Yeah. When your greatest talent, your greatest skill uh, intersects with your greatest passion, uh, I think then you have found your sweet spot in life. And then you can build upon that. I think that's what most successful people have done. Uh, they may not have been aware of it or conscious of it, right. but I think that would really probably be the book that I would end up writing if somebody asked me that question. So, and, and again, <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people, like, they may think they have a lot of different skills. What, what would you say, when did you discover what your greatest skill was? I mean, obviously, I was, passion is sports, right? So, Well, I was very young, Jeremy. My dad, who was a coach and a teacher in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, on June 15th, uh, 1947, I had just turned seven, and he said to me, uh, we're going to Philadelphia and we're going to see a ball game. I didn't really understand what was going on, but uh, off we went to Philadelphia. I uh, went to Scheib Park, 21st in Lehigh in Philadelphia. Uh, the Philadelphia A's were in town then, and they were playing a doubleheader that afternoon with the Cleveland Indians. And I sat there, I remember vividly sitting in the upper deck on the third base side, and I was captured, riveted by the sights and the sound and the smell of baseball. Mm -hmm. And the color, everything was green, grass and seats and the walls. And, and I woke up the next morning, uh, Jeremy, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to be a ball player, mm -hmm. and, and I dedicated myself to that, you know, all the way through college into pro baseball, and and then uh, switched hats and went into the executive end of the business, and here I am some 50 years later, and I've spent every every year of my life, every day of my life in this business of professional athletics, but it all started as a seven-year-old. Yeah. So I think the earliest, earlier in life, you can plant a seed and get a young person excited or passionate about some particular area or skill, uh, I think those kids are better off. I, I certainly was. I knew right from being a little boy what I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a fellow catcher, and I know you caught two. Who is, <laughs> who's been one of your favorite pitchers to catch? Well, my first year as a pro ball player, I went to Wake Forest and played baseball there and then signed with the Phillies in June of 1962. Mm -hmm. I was a catcher, and they sent me to Miami in the Florida State League, one of their farm clubs. And uh, arriving that same week was a young right-handed pitcher they had just signed, 18 years old. His name was Ferguson Jenkins. Sure. And, uh, and for that summer, and again, the next year, he was there, and I got to catch him on many nights. And uh, little did we realize that 18-year-old Fergie Jenkins was a future Hall of Famer. Uh, but I look back and uh, count it quite a privilege you know, to have been a teammate of his, his and a battery mate. And uh, every time I see Fergie, he always reminds people that this was my first catcher, this is <laughs> my first catcher. So uh, I'm very pleased about that. That's very a true, a true honor. Um, so how'd you get started in the NBA? Well, I'd spent uh, seven years in baseball as a, as a minor league catcher and then five years running minor league teams for the Phillies. And in June of 1968, I walked into my office one day at the ballpark in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where I was the GM of the team, and there was a message to return a call to a Jack Ramsey in Inglewood, California. And uh, I thought, my, the basketball Jack Ramsey? And, and I returned the call. He was the GM of the 76ers at the time. He explained to me he was about to become the coach. He was also out there to trade Wilt Chamberlain to the Lakers. And he said, I need somebody to run the front office. Would you be interested? I had never met Jack Ramsey. I was 28 years old. And uh, after a couple of interviews, they hired me. And I left baseball. I didn't think that would happen, but I did. And this was the first opportunity to go to a major league sport. It wasn't baseball, but I went there. And that, uh, gosh, that has started a 46-year run, wow. you know, in the world of pro basketball. But it all started with that phone call out of a clear blue sky from Jack Ramsey. So obviously you made a huge impact and he found out about you. How did he hear about you? Good question and I once asked him about that uh, and, and all Jack said was uh, there was a lot more known about you here in Philadelphia than you thought. Huh. Uh, the, the Spartanburg Club was a farm club of the Phillies and uh, 
we had had good success. Uh, some good young players had come through Spartanburg and were on their way to Philadelphia. And uh, we had promoted well and gotten uh, some ink nationally. And so I guess the Philly papers and media had picked up on that. And I think that's what Jack meant. So what, what eventually led you to Orlando? Because you um, were with a few different teams, right? Well, I spent that one year as the business manager of the 76ers. That was the 68-69 season. And then in the summer of 69, I left and to go to Chicago as the GM of the Bulls. I uh, was there for four years. I uh, love Chicago. Uh, still do. Still my favorite city. And uh, we had a good run with those four years. But when that came to a close for me, I went to Atlanta spent one year with the Hawks. That was the year we traded Pete Maravich to New Orleans. And then in the summer of 1974, uh, the GM post of the Sixers was open, <clears throat> and I went back to Philadelphia and spent 12 years there. We had three different ownership groups, but I survived, and we spent 12 years. Wow. I got to the finals four times in the Julius Irving era, <clears throat> and then finally won the NBA title in 1983 after... Moses Malone joined us. And then in the summer of 86, I moved down here to Orlando uh, to take on the biggest challenge of my career, and that is trying to help create an expansion team from scratch. And we were successful in that venture. Uh, the Orlando Magic was birthed in April of 1987, and here we are now in our 25th season. We're having a 25th anniversary season, and uh, a lot has happened here in Orlando since we arrived in June of 86. So I've just walked you through, Jeremy, about, about 20, 46 years. In, in Congratulations about, on the 25th year. In about, in about two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations on that. Um, I wanted to ask you this. Obviously, that's a huge undertaking to start an NBA franchise. How does that process start, and what do you do to even begin that? I think we, we felt that the most important thing we had to do here, because Orlando was untested as a sports market, there'd never been major league sports here, and right. there really was no place to play, and you know we, we had a lot going against us. So I think we had to make a statement to the league, and we had to get moving on it immediately back in June of 86, and we thought the best way to do that was to rally the community and get deposits on season tickets. Mm -hmm. So we, we went around and pushed hard to get $100 deposits on season tickets. Now this is to a team that didn't exist in a league that hadn't committed to expanding where there was no history of sports and no place to play. So we didn't have a lot going for us in that regard. But uh, the community rallied incredibly. And by September of 86, when the owners had their meeting out in Arizona, uh, we could go before them and say, we have deposits on 14,000 season tickets. Believe me, that got the league's attention. But because most of those teams, if they had three or 4,000 season tickets, you know, they'd have been thrilled. Yeah. And so we're saying to them, we've got deposits on 14,000. I think that really turned the league's head. I think they really uh, began to think, ooh, maybe what's going on down there in central Florida? That we, we definitely got their attention. And yeah. So that was the most important thing we did early on. That's amazing. And getting 14,000, you know, commitments like that. What was, what was some things that you did to do that? I was speaking anywhere people would have me from blue light specials at Kmart to, uh, you know, a hand of bridge somewhere. I mean, I was going wherever they invited me right. and, uh, and, and delivering my message and encouraging them to get involved. I spoke hundreds of times. Uh, throughout that period. Uh, the media was very good to us. You know, they definitely got behind us and, you know, really did a good job of helping us get the message out there. And uh, that was that was awfully important. And then we had some major uh, people, the Disney people, for example, and, uh, and other major corporations here who made some huge commitments to us early on mm -hmm. uh, that were invaluable. The Orlando Sentinel, the newspaper, uh, got behind us in, in a huge way, in every way. Uh, I remember the very first day at the press conference, uh, Tip Lippendahl, who was the publisher, came up to me afterwards and said, put us down for 100 season tickets and a skybox. That was on the first day. That's amazing. And I thought, my goodness, I mean, that was incredible. So we had some very early uh, community boosters who were so good to us. 
What was the hardest part about early on and in, in the beginning in the first few seasons? Because it's not easy to, to, to get that, you know, keep it rallied, I guess. Well, that's a good point. And we, uh, you know, the 89-90 season, our first season, uh, there was enormous excitement. We were sold out every night. We didn't have a, a very productive season, obviously, with an expansion it's team. pretty difficult, but, yeah. But our fans were into it, and they, and they were so proud that we had a team, and they were in the NBA, and, and they were just thrilled. Uh, it did get a little bit tougher the next year. You know, the novelty began to wear, up, wear off. However, uh, in, uh, at the end of the third year, 1992, we won the draft lottery. And who was sitting there but one Shaquille O'Neal? And uh, that gave us a huge boost. And, and within a year, you know, we were contenders. Uh, we were making great progress and, you know, competing with all the big boys. And, and Shaq, uh, you know, brought that uh, tremendous uh, body of his and his skill and, and put us on the map. So we got a great break in 92 when we needed a lift. Uh, that lottery came in time, just in time for us. Yeah. I know you do a lot of speaking to, to big companies. Um, what are some of the lessons that you impart on these big companies? I speak primarily in three areas to corporate America, uh, leadership, teamwork, and winning, extreme winning. Mm -hmm. I find that those are the three topics uh, that corporate America is most interested in. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've crafted my talks in those three areas. I, um, I'm constantly looking for new stories and anecdotes and uh, information that would encourage or uplift or be valuable in the corporate world. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I talk about the seven sides of leadership for the 21st century and, and then I talk about the eight qualities of great teams um, and then the extreme winning and, and there's a certain element that wants me to talk about that to their sales staff or uh, other parts of their organization. Uh, what do the winners possess? What are the, the great winners in sports and other fields? What do they have? And I've made a pretty thorough study of that. I'm in the process of writing a book about it right now uh, called Extreme Winning. Mm -hmm. And what does it take? What do the winners have that uh, sets them apart? So what's one of the attributes that you found that winners have that you maybe be surprised about? Well, first of all, they have an extreme dream in their life. Uh, dreams are uh, a big part, and I just shared with you where my dream hit me when I was a seven-year-old kid and right. had that dream of being a ball player. I think that uh, every winner somewhere in their life, uh, a dream hit them, took over their life, captured them, uh, just drove them You know, the, the rest of their life. You, you check out the great winners, and that dream was planted. Mm -hmm. uh, extreme preparation, I've noticed that. Uh, they are so thorough in their preparation. They leave nothing to chance. Uh, they're, they're on top of every little detail. Uh, extreme focus. Uh, the winners have the ability to really zero in on uh, what's going on, particularly what's going on now. Uh, they're not uh, way out in the future, and they're not hung up on yesterday. Uh, they are really focused on what's happening right now. They literally go through life with blinders on. You know, they are locked in, and... Uh, Nothing's going to divert them. Th those are some of the yeah. thoughts, uh, Jeremy, that come to my mind. What are some of the things that, I mean, obviously, you've had a real, an, an amazing career, long career, and you don't show any signs of stopping. Um, what inspires you to keep going, keep, you know, keep producing? Well, I'm 73 now, Jeremy. I think the best years of our life really should be that 70 to 90 period, you know, assuming our health is good. Right. Uh, I think by then uh, children are raised, in many, in many cases your grandchildren are raised, that's not the case in my life, but uh, your children are raised, uh, you've made your mark in your career, um, you know, you, whatever you wanted to establish or accomplish professionally, you've, prob you've done it. Right. And, uh, and now you're in a position with some of that pressure removed to really uh, zero in on what you like to do and what's important and what you think is a major contribution. Right. Uh, you've got wisdom that you didn't have 20 years prior. Uh, you've got experience, life experiences. In my case, uh, I feel an obligation to invest back down in, 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 the, in the generations coming behind me. Uh, so many people invested in me yeah. uh, over the years and uh, were so valuable in my life. I, I want to pass that on to those coming behind me. And I'm doing it primarily uh, through my speaking and through my writing. Yeah. What big mistakes do you see people making in business? 
Well, that's a good question, Jeremy. Um, I, I'm not sure I have a specific answer on that, uh, but I, I think this, um, control that which you have control over and, and let everything else go. You know, we have, we have a tendency in business and other areas of life to try and control everything that goes on. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would say we, we, we have very little control when you get right down to it, right. aside from our attitude. I think we can control our attitude every day, but uh, just zero in on those things you have control over and, uh, and uh, release the rest of it because you have no control over it. For example, we have no control over the weather. Uh, you really have no control over the economy of the world. Uh, you have no control over the global warming or the ozone layer or uh, the population issues of China. I mean, you just don't have any control there. So right. I think that's important. And one other thing in regard to that question, uh, keep it simple. You know, we have a tendency to get life so complicated, get business so complicated. Uh, keep things simple. You know, life really is basically pretty simple. And uh, don't, don't spend a lot of time complicating it for everybody. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Oftentimes we do complicate things. Um, what, I mean, it seems like you with your career you just kind of grew and grew and grew. What were some of the roadblocks you ran up against? Well, initially I wanted to be a major league ball player. So the first roadblock was probably curveballs. You know, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't hit them very well. Those are tough though. So that was, that was a, that was an immediate roadblock. Uh, I, I think uh, the important thing, Jeremy, is to have a vision in your life. And in my case, my vision was I wanted to run a, a Major League Baseball team. You know, that was the vision. That's where I wanted to get. Uh, I ended up running Major League Basketball teams. Uh, but that means that there are going to be lots of hurdles. You've got to be patient. Uh, you've got to be, uh, you've got to pay your dues. Uh, those are certainly roadblocks. You, you can't get anywhere without experience. And you can't be in a rush. You can't rush experience. You can't rush wisdom. Yeah. And so probably the biggest hurdle I've always had is uh, uh, being in a hurry and, and wanting to <clears throat> get to my goal without paying the due, your dues. And yeah. So you've got to have a good foundation. And the only way you can do that is to uh, keep investing and not, not get too rushed. Because if you get to a top spot and you don't have a strong foundation, at some point you're going to crumble. Yeah. What's been um, a low point for you in your life or career that you had to overcome? Well, I've had a number of them. Uh, my father uh, was killed in an automobile accident oh my God. Uh, driving home from my college graduation Wow! in early June of 1962. You know, that certainly was a, a blow to me. It was a blow to our family. Mm. And, um, you know, Sorry that was to hear a, that. Wow. a difficult time. Now, that was... You know, over 50 years ago, but uh, it was still a very tough time in, in our home and our family. Most recently, three years ago, uh, I was diagnosed with cancer, uh, a blood cancer called multiple myeloma. Mm. So uh, I've been involved in uh, dealing with all of that and uh, getting my health back and, and then trying to be a good messenger uh, to others about this whole issue of cancer. Mm. Uh, we never go through life, Jeremy, uh, untouched. Uh, and I have learned a great deal through the tough times, mm. probably a lot more uh, than I ever learned through the good times. Um, many years back, I, I went through a painful divorce, oh, and yeah. that, was, that was a hard, hard time in my life. But, you know, you learn from that and you grow from that. And one of the great lessons I've ever had uh, is simply this. Uh, don't waste your sufferings. Don't waste them. Because uh, in those tough periods, we are so teachable. Uh, we are so eager, you know, at that point right. uh, to, uh, to be taught and learn. Uh, and during the good times, we have a tendency to get very independent. Uh, that I've got all of this stuff solved. I know exactly how to handle life. Right. Uh, but the hard times really uh, give us a very teachable spirit. Yeah, that sounds like it was very difficult. What did you do to get through those that treatment when you were diagnosed well at that point in uh, january of of 11 you know after the shock wore off i realized that uh <clears throat> i had to make a decision you know and and it was a spiritual decision like god why did you allow this right. you know how could you uh, not protect me from this or uh, lord you allowed it 
And now uh, I'm going to really take advantage of this privilege that you've given me, you know, to be helpful to other people. Listen, Jeremy, one out of one out of two men in America will end up with cancer. Scary. Uh, one out of three women. Yeah. So I, I guess I want to be a, a voice of warning. I want to be an encourager uh, to those people who are dealing and battling mm -hmm. cancer. I want to be a, a voice in this world of, of uh, illness related to cancer. I want to be a difference maker. Uh, I've just, I, I have a book coming out soon uh, called The Mission is Remission, uh, Hope for Battling Cancer, mm -hmm. which I tell my cancer story, what I've learned. Yeah. And so that, uh, that, that's really something that I feel called to do. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That's a really, really hard time, I'm sure. Um, so what do you tell people? Like, I'm sure you speak to a lot of people who are fighting cancer. What's, what's one thing that they enjoy hearing or, you know, really impacts them? Well, Jeremy, my prime message uh, when I have an opportunity like this is to speak to people, particularly men. And the message is do not neglect your yearly physical. Mm -hmm. That's what I tell them. Because in, in my yearly physical, in January of 11, uh, the doctor at the end of the day said, there's something in your blood work that doesn't look right. Hmm. That's what she said. And sent me to an oncologist, and he looked at it and said, yeah, there's a reason that blood work doesn't look right. You've got an illness. <laughs> and I remember saying, me, an illness? Mr. Health? Right. And he explained to me what multiple myeloma was, one of the blood cancers. So I encourage men particularly, J Jeremy, who have a tendency to say, eh, I don't need a physical. I'll take my chances. Right. I don't like doctors. Typical man, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll be okay. You know, and, and um, so I'm urging them, you know, uh, get your physical. Yeah. And chances are everything will be fine. But if there is a problem, <clears throat> you sure want to know about it early yeah. rather than later. Yeah. Because later may be too late. But with modern medicine, which is so wonderful these days, Jeremy, uh, if you can get on stuff early, you know, it can be a lifesaver. Yeah. And then you must have been surprised about that because you've run over like 50 marathons. You brought nothing can touch me. I'm a beacon of health, right? Yeah, that was my feeling. Yes. And, yeah. and just prior to this, to this diagnosis, I had just finished the Disney marathon, which was my 58th marathon. I was 70 years old at the time and finished my 58th marathon, and I, uh, yeah, I thought I was indestructible. Wow. So you can imagine when the news came that, Shocking. Uh, that I was dealing with cancer. Man, I was just stunned, shocked. My family was, the community was, the, the magic, Orlando Magic World was. Yeah. So at that point, uh, you know, the main thing was to, I learned, was to have a good attitude and above all, listen to the doctors. And the good news is, in my case, there were, there are new medications coming and new forms of chemo that are very effective and they've they've I've, they've worked very well for me yeah. and uh, right now uh, my blood numbers are right on and the doctors say they they don't see any signs of multiple myeloma so i'm that's I'm great certain, congratulations I'm that's amazing that's great now you say the good attitude and sometimes it's easier said than done like when we're healthy yeah we have a good attitude but at that low point it's hard what did you do to actually fight your, you know, fight your thoughts of thinking, woe is me, as opposed to the opposite? Dr. Robert Reynolds, who was, my, who was and is the oncologist that I've been working with, he, uh, he told me on the first day, he said, you're going to do well with this illness. And I remember saying, why? He said, well, he said, I know you speak and write about optimism and having a good outlook on life and a good attitude. He said, that's going to be extremely valuable to you you know, in this, in this battle with multiple myeloma. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was right. He, he made that call. So I've learned uh, down in the trenches of life, you know, when life uh, appears to be turning against you, you've got a choice. I'm going to have a negative, defeated, pessimistic attitude, or I'm going to approach this in a positive, optimistic, upbeat way. Right. And that's what I elected to do. Yeah. And I'm really convinced, Jeremy, that the mind and the body, you know, really are connected. Mm-hmm. And that your body responds uh, to an outlook that is positive yeah. and, and is uh, upbeat and enthusiastic and passionate about life. I think your body responds to that. Yeah. 
and, and, and the doctor said to me, and this was so important, they said, you go on and live your life. You, you just live your life by doing what you always do to the best of your ability. And he said, and we'll tuck the medical stuff around that. And that's what has happened. I've been able to keep my speaking schedule and wow. my, my um, Orlando Magic uh, work and writing books, all the things that I love to do and have been doing for years, I've continued to do that. And, and they've tucked all the medical stuff around my schedule. And that, mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's an important way to go. You don't want to just sit home and, and, uh, and fuss and fume and just ruminate over the fact that you're, you've got a cancer issue. Yeah. Get out and continue to live your life. Yeah. Going through some of those low points, what's been a really proud accomplishment, Pat, that you've had? Well, I think the proudest accomplishment, uh, Jeremy, would have to be related to our family. We have not, over the years we adopted fourteen children, and uh, right now they're nineteen children. That's unbelievable. Uh, we have raised nineteen. They're all adults now. Uh, the uh, youngest is twenty-eight. The oldest wow. is about to turn forty-two. And uh, they have presented us with 14 grandchildren. Uh, 13, I guess 12 of the 14 live here in Orlando, and uh, the other two are over in Sarasota, Florida. And uh, that, that we're very proud of the grandkids, and uh, you know, we want to make a difference in their life. So we're helping them uh, you know, get, get educated at a fine school here in Orlando. Right. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we get them to church and Sunday school every, every Sunday. And we're uh, fully committed to investing in the lives of the grandchildren. So that's probably yeah. uh, been the most interesting and rewarding and exciting yeah. thing that's going on in our lives now. The, the grandkids are aged from six months up to nine years of age. Holy cow. So, so we're going to be involved in their lives for quite a few years. Yeah. Yeah. If you didn't bring this up at some point in the interview, I was definitely going to bring this up because when I read it, I had to reread it three times to make sure it was the correct number. Like. Is that sure it says 19? And then it lists, obviously goes on, lists all the names and ages. So when people have a hard enough time raising one or two kids, how do you even begin to raise 19? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I look back and sometimes I wonder how we did it. <laughs> but, uh, but we did. There was one year when 16 of the children were all teenagers at the same time. Oh, my God. For, for, 12, for one full year. Uh, that was the year... Woo, I realize why some animals eat their young. <laughs> I think the best advice I can give um, really comes from one of the Psalms. Solomon in this 127th Psalm, the third verse, he said, Lo, which means listen, children are a heritage. And that means they're a gift. They're an assignment of the Lord. And so I keep encouraging families and parents, uh, look upon your children as an investment. Uh, the best investment you've got, really. Look upon them in that manner. And everything you're doing in their life, everything you're teaching them, every activity they're involved in, every meal that you serve them, I mean, every piece of wisdom you pass on, uh, you are investing in the lives of your children. Uh, so I tell them, no matter if you're getting no response, no encouragement, no positive signs, keep investing, keep investing, keep investing. Because you are getting through, even if you don't think you are. And eventually, you're going to see returns on your investment. And, and it'll be a wonderful, fulfilling, uh, proud moment when you begin to see those returns. So uh, don't get discouraged. Keep investing. And remember, your children are a gift from the Lord. And, and your job is to keep pouring yourself into their life. And yeah. uh, it'll pay great dividends, believe me. So what motivated you to have 19 children? Well, it was not, we, we had three birth kids, right. uh, and life was good. We were about to win a championship in Philadelphia. My wife talked endlessly about adopting children that didn't look like us, endlessly. And I just couldn't fathom it and wanted no part of it. And for 10 years, I squelched it. However, at the 10-year mark, it became a huge issue. Mm. And uh, I, I had to do something, you know, to, to keep the ship afloat. And so I, uh, I took the initiative. I found out that South Korea at that time was the nation where you could most readily adopt. Mm -hmm. uh, talked to the agency. We discovered that they had a picture of two little girls in, uh, who had been abandoned at a police station in Seoul, wow. South Korea. And uh, the, the, the social worker came and showed us the picture and said, uh, would, you allow, would you like to adopt these two little girls? 
Uh, we had a vote of the three children. I mean, it was unanimous, uh, the, the five to nothing. Uh, let's go get it done. And yeah. so, in September of 1983, these two little girls arrived at the Philadelphia airport. Wow. And I, and I was smitten, Jeremy. I mean, it didn't take much. I was converted very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, we had another birth kid and had six children when we moved here to Orlando in, June, in the summer of 86. And then we kept hearing about other children, and I guess we just had a hard time saying no. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that's, people ask, how did you, why, and how, and, and uh, that's the best answer I can give you. We, right. we learned about them and saw pictures, and we, we just said, you know what, what's two more? What's for, you know, the next thing you know, we had uh, 19 we had, later. Yeah, you know, that's unbelievable. Logistically, I don't, I can't even picture that. But um, I also want to know, Pat, from you, you've you know done a lot, and you've probably had a lot of mentors. Who are some of the mentors you've had throughout your life and career? That's a good question, Jeremy. I was very fortunate growing up. Um, Roley Carpenter was my best friend. <clears throat> His father, Bob Carpenter, owned the Philadelphia Phillies, and I was a huge baseball guy. Roley and I were close friends, and uh, so Roley's dad, Bob Carpenter, was was a huge mentor in my life, and a and a and a man that uh, you know, well, nothing would have happened in my sports career without him. Um, when I got to Spartanburg, there was a wonderful man there who owned the the ball club in Spartanburg. His name was Mr. R. E. Littlejohn. And uh, he took an interest in me far beyond baseball. And for four years, he just uh, taught me and educated me and poured himself into me. And I, I, to this day, I've written two books about Mr. Little John. And to this day, I mean, not a day goes by I don't think about him, uh, think about something that he taught me. And yeah. I find myself now kind of a Mr. Little John to a whole other generation. Yeah. Uh, Bill Veck was a, a, a huge mentor, the great baseball owner. and flamboyant promoter. He took an interest in my life. Yeah. He and for the Chicago White Sox, right? Yeah, he owned the yeah. Sox on two different occasions and uh, Baseball Hall of Famer. Uh, I've written a book about Bill Veck that will be out this spring and called Marketing Your Dreams. And uh, uh, Bill had an enormous effect on my life, still does to this day. Those, those are a few that come to mind. The current owner of our team here in Orlando is Rich DeVos, uh, the co-founder of the Amway organization. And he and his family have owned the Magic now for over 20 years. And uh, Rich uh, is the kind of mentor, just watching his life and just observing him and seeing how uh, he runs a team or runs a business and deals with people. You, you can't help but come away uh, without wonderful lessons from this man. He's been an enormous influence in my life as well. So as you can see, Jeremy, I've been very, very fortunate. Yeah have a number of these people around me who have been made, made a huge difference in my life. Yeah. What's one of those lessons from Rich that really strikes you? Well, I think the greatest lesson you're going to get from Rich is, is uh, about empowering people. Uh, he has often asked his role with Amway, and Rich will say, I'm the head cheerleader, and for 50 plus years, uh, you know, that's what he's been doing, yeah. uh, traveling around the world, traveling all over America. And either from in a group setting or in an individual setting, uh, Rich is there to cheer you on. Yeah. And even to this day, he's 87 now. He spends most of his time in a wheelchair, uh, but still sharp and still very uh, much with it. And Rich, uh, you know, every time I see him, you know, he's cheering you on. Pat, you're doing a great job and couldn't do it without you. And we're so grateful to you. I mean, that's how he talks to you. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, that's the that's the top guy. And. You know, when you're addressed in that manner and when you've got a man like that cheering you on, yeah. I, I, there's nothing you can't accomplish. You yeah. know, Pat, I appreciate your time. I have one last question um, sure. for you. But before I ask it, where can people find out more about you? What's exciting now for you? Well, I have a website. It's patwilliams.com. And I invite your viewers and listeners to plug in any time, patwilliams.com. Uh, the Twitter page is uh, <clears throat> Orlando Magic Pat. And I love emails, uh, Jeremy. So if anybody wants to drop me a note, it's pwilliams at orlandomagic.com. That's kind of you. Williams at orlandomagic.com. And uh, I'm always happy to hear from people. So what type of talks or companies, um, you know, if someone's looking to have you come out and speak, um, what kind of companies do you like to speak to or work with? Well, I find, Jeremy, that uh, it's a wide range. It may be 
an insurance group or it may be a real estate group, uh, could be a high tech gathering, uh, lots of meetings in the field of healthcare uh, that I'm always uh, enjoying chatting with. And so, uh, you know, it's a wide range. But I think my, my three topics are universal. Uh, leadership, teamwork, uh, extreme winning. I think that affects every corporation, whether, you know, it's a Fortune 500 company or a mom and pop widget factory. Right. I think those three topics are relevant to everybody. Yeah. So, Pat, my last question, which a lot of you has always asked me to ask the guest, is, I mean, you're so busy. You know, marathons, the Orlando Magic books. What's your daily routine look like? How do you get so much done? I get up in the morning. I do my devotional, my Bible study, Jeremy, very early. I've got five newspapers sitting at the end of the driveway. I'm still a newspaper guy. Uh, I do check my, my emails and, uh, you know, the sports update in the morning. Uh, I have an exercise bike at home, and I have a little home gym, and so I get my workout in right there, and it's that way it's done for the day. I, I've got my physical workout. Uh, head to the office. Um, uh, the children are all raised, so I don't have any obligations at home at night, and so I work late. Um, you know, I'll, I'll work many nights, you know, till 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Um, have dinner with my wife on, on some nights. She works and travels as well, so we're gone a lot. Uh, I come home, uh, watch a little bit of, of college basketball or what might be going on. I uh, do a lot of reading at home. I try and read at least an hour a day from good books. Yeah. Uh, I'm generally in bed by 11. And uh, sleep, uh, I, need, I need eight good hours of sleep, uh, at least eight, you know, so I'm, I'm sleeping well and a lot. And then many weeks, Jeremy, most weeks I'm on the road, uh, you know, traveling somewhere to speak. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I spend a lot of time in the Orlando airport and uh, flying to this city or the next, you know, to deliver my next talk. Yeah. So, um, and then, of course, during the basketball season, we've got 41 home games, and, and uh, I'm, I see probably, um, oh, 37 or 38 of them, my schedule allows that. Wow. So I'm at the games every night as well. So it's a full schedule. And, uh, and then in the meantime, you know, the writing of books takes time as well. Sure. <laughs> so I've got I've to find time for that as well. Yeah. So it, it, it means that um, I guess 16 hours a day, you know, I'm locked in and, uh, and focused on what has to be done for that day. Yeah. So where can people check out, everyone should check out Coach Wooden's Greatest Secret. Where can people get it? Where can people check it out? Well, Jeremy, the best way to order books uh, is Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, BooksAmillion.com. Although I am a fanatic about bookstores, I still love to go into those Barnes and Nobles and yeah. Books A Million. I just pour through bookstores and I want to physically see what's new and what's out there and hold it in my hand and... And, uh, you know, I buy many, many books in the course of the year as well, and I'm constantly reading. So this book, uh, Coach Wooden's Greatest Secret, will be in bookstores yeah. as well. Well, Pat, I really appreciate your time. You have a very busy schedule. It's a true honor. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. I'm glad I can visit with you.